Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 4th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain why the push to make permanent changes to the spending side by reinstating a defined benefit program and increasing the BSA, among other things, is putting the fiscal cart before the horse. Second, we discuss how we are beginning to approach the process of winnowing down the 48 candidates now running in the special election for Alaska's congressional seat to a more manageable number. And third, We discuss how the AKLNG project is being perceived in the market in light of the changing situation regarding Russian gas. And now, let's join Michael. Brad comes on board uh, to dissect and uh, digest with us the weekly top three. And we got some big ones coming up today, Brad. We're going to be talking about, first and foremost, all of this money that the legislature is spending that they don't even have in the coffers yet. And it's amazing how they want to spend it before, I mean, they, how are they going to raise some of this money? I mean, they're talking about millions of dollars a year in new spending already uh, to try and fix a problem that has already been fixed. I guess make a problem worse that's already been fixed, uh, so to speak. Uh, let's take on number one, which includes defined benefits and more. Well, there's two There's two issues that's, that, that caught my attention Uh during, during the course of the week, one was an article in the ADN uh, about uh, restoring defined benefits um, as opposed to defined contributions. And the second was a story in the Fairbanks News Miner uh, about uh, uh, K through 12 uh, changing the BSA, increasing the BSA, and, uh, and, and some proposed uh, inflation proofing the BSA so that it increases going forward uh, tied, uh, tied to inflation. Both of those immediately struck me uh, as putting the cart, fending cart before the horse. We, we, don't, we don't have our revenue problem resolved. Uh, we don't have a fiscal plan that has decided how we're going to uh, set revenues and what, what amount of revenues uh, we're going to have uh, to spend. And, and these proposals to increase spending or fix future spending. I mean, these are permanent fixes, both the, both the, the change to the defined benefit plan and uh, the change to the BSA. Uh, these are permanent fixes going forward. We don't have a permanent revenue plan that deals with them. So what, what they're really doing is they're setting up uh, additional PFD cuts uh, going into the future uh, by setting spending plans without, setting, without you know, establishing where the revenue is going to come from. I think Mike Prox uh, uh, said it best in the Fairbanks News, main, news uh, uh, Minor article uh, when he said that, uh, that essentially that we're putting the cart before the horse, that we need to have a fiscal plan before we have uh, a fiscal plan in place before we have, uh, we'd be ad- we're adre- we should be addressing uh, additional uh, uh, spending issues. Once we have a fiscal plan in place, uh, hopefully having all Alaskans if we're going to have individual contributions, if we're going to have personal contributions to, to state government, having all Alaskans contributing to state government, once we have that in place, then I think it's fair to bring up 
these additional spending plans, but then all Alaskans can be involved in pushing back and saying, look, that's more spending than we're willing to pay for. Right. What, as, as long as you have it tied, as long as you don't have that defined and the, and the, and the, the, the consequence is that it's going to take a, it's going to come at the expense of PFD cuts. You really are only affecting middle and lower income Alaska families. And they're the only ones who, who are being, you know, who are, who are having to pay for these things. Uh, and they're trying to shove back, but without, you know, the top 20% involved in shoving back uh, on the spending, you don't get any place. So we, we've got the we've got the cart before the horse. I, each of these spending plans have have issues. That going back to defined benefits uh, certainly has has issues uh, that have been that have been raised by both you know commentators as well as legislators. Uh, in, the increase in uh, in the BSA and the increase in, in in tying the BSA to inflation certainly has issues. Uh, but but even before you get to those issues, we need to have a fiscal plan in place that tells us who's going to be contributing these revenues uh, uh, determined so that those who are going to be paying these revenues have the ability to uh, to push back on the spending. You know, and, and of course, a lot of the spending is things that, uh, as you point out, the base, uh, the BSA, the base student allocation formula increase uh, and everything else. But one of the big things that they've been talking about now is of course the renewal or revival of a defined benefits program, um, which will cost. Uh, well, first they started just talking about first responders, police, and fire. That was going to be another seven million dollars a year, and of course the teachers all pitched in as well. And now it's another seventy million dollars a year, and that's going forward. And that, of course, doesn't uh, preclude us having another downer year where all of a sudden, I mean, we've whittled our defined co- uh, benefits. Uh, liability down from $12 billion to $4 billion. That's where we are today, which is more manageable. But at one point, there was questions about whether or not we were going to have to spend over half the state budget just to balance the defined benefits uh, underfundedness, uh, as it were. And yet they want to start that they want to start that clock back up. I mean, it's uh, it's insanity. Yeah, it's a it's a wedge issue. What's, what they're trying to do with the first responders is is take the take the best argument they think they have, which is which is the retention of the first responders, take the best argument they think they have and get their foot in the door by by passing that bill. And then I think Senator Stedman had it right. And then, you know, it's just gonna open the door for everybody else. Then the teachers come through and then other government employees uh, uh, come through as well. And right back uh, right back to where we were before. So it, this isn't, I mean the first responders want you to want you to think about want you to think that it's in terms of just the first responders uh, and the retention of first responders, but that's not that's not where this issue goes uh, once we uh, once we crack that door open. But as I say, even before we get to that door, we ought to be determining what revenues what what revenues we're talking about and who's going to pay those revenues. I mean, it, it the going down the track we are without resolving the the, the fiscal plan without resolving the state's you know what, what's coming on the revenue side. Um, it, it's 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 putting putting the fiscal cart before the horse in in terms of trying to spend money we don't know yet uh, that we're going to have and who's and who's contributing who's who's going to be contributing to it and who ought to be involved in pushing back on that. I mean, the the, the problem is they don't want the top twenty percent engaged, right? Those who are spending don't want the top twenty percent engaged because they know. That if the donor class becomes engaged, they're going to push back. They're going to push back on spending and push back hard, uh, and they're not going to be able to get away with this stuff. So, so they're trying to avoid dealing with the revenue issue, dealing with who pays, uh, uh, and and push the spending forward. Get it set in 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 statute. Get it set in programs, and then the fallout of that is going to be well. We're sorry, but it has to come out of the PFD additional. PFD right, cuts. we, we got to. So, and this is, I mean, this may be the long term, really the long term plan. Uh, that that is the initial thing they want the PFD. They want to be able to spend it, uh, and this is why they have been so reticent this entire time to address the fiscal policy working group's holistic plan, which deals with new spending, and savings, and cuts, and new revenues and new oil taxes and everything else it was a, and the PFD it was all inclusive but they don't want to they don't want to talk about that at all and it leads me to believe more and more 
that that's really what the ultimate goal here is to strip the PFD eventually out completely, not make it a 75-25 for uh, you know, state versus PFDs, but just basically take all 100%. And then, of course, we know what will happen five years beyond that. Then there will be a call for new revenues and new taxes and everything else. So the government consumes everything on the table and then some. Yep. They're trying to avoid, I mean, they're trying to avoid, as I, as I, as I say, they're trying to avoid engaging the top 20%. They're trying to use spending approaches that don't engage the, the donor class because they know that if the donor class is going is, is, is gonna to have to spend, the donor class is going to push back. What we've, what we've had the last few legislatures is, is this, this as, as we've talked about before on the show, this unholy alliance between the top 20% Republicans and the, and the Democrats about government spending. The top, 20, the top 20% Republicans saying, we won't stop your spending as long as you don't make us pay for it. And the Democrats saying, well, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna charge you for it. We'll just take it out of the PFD and, and continue spending. And, they, and they're trying to avoid engaging uh, the top 20% engaging the donor class um, uh, in spending uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on in, in, in pushing back on spending. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's part and parcel. You're right there. They haven't put the fiscal plan on the, on the floor. Uh, the, the fiscal policy working group plan, uh, even through committee, they haven't put it on the floor. Uh, and they're just trying to get this spending, all of this spending out in front uh, before they, before they engage on who's going to have to pay for this spending. Well, we know the problem. We can see the problem. As I was saying before we came on the air, the problem is, is that a lot of us can see all the, we don't have all the answers, but we can at least admit that there's a problem where many of them are just going, no problem. We've got it covered. And of course it just continues to, uh, to, you know, uh, again, just continues down the same road of doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Uh, all right, well, let's move over to number two and we'll get, uh, we'll get the first part of it here with number two which, of course, is the wild and woolly days of the U.S. House race, the special election, the special primary, with 51 people submitting their names for the office, now down to 48 because three uh, three withdrew their names yesterday. But uh, almost 50 people going to be on this ballot. Uh, and it is uh, all I could see is all the talking heads and the political punditry is just like scratching their head going, we have no idea what the hell is going to happen here because it is a, <laughs> a total hot mess. Um, so give us, uh, give us some thoughts on this, uh, from yourself. Well, I, I've started to think about how I should think about it. I mean, with, uh, with 48 names out there, uh, you know, you, you can throw a dart or you can, you know, just sort of immediately react to a name. Uh, but frankly, for me, uh, since I sort of work my world by charts, I started charting it out. Uh, and, and that forces me to think about how I'm going to think about it. Um, and I've developed certain categories that I think are, are things that are the right way, at least for me, uh, uh, on, on how to think about uh, uh, breaking the, the, the group of 48 down into, uh, down into certain categories uh, and then sort of sorting through uh, who best uh, who best fits uh, what I think are the important criteria. So uh, when we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what those categories are and how I've started to uh, started to break break the candidates down. Well, and and before you get into that part, and I do, I mean, because we got a couple three four minutes here, I wanna I wanna break backwards for just a second and look at this and realize that with 50 candidates, 48 candidates, polling is almost impossible. Because nobody's going to reel off 48 names in a poll phone call. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to reel off all these names. And, and, and it really, in a lot of ways, is going to come down to name recognition. Um, I was shocked that Sarah Palin threw her name into the race. But in hindsight, realizing that really, with the number of candidates that you have, that name recognition is going to be paramount on this. Um, somebody said in one of the articles, I can't remember who it said, basically said she could go lay down on the couch until election day and still be guaranteed <laughs> a slot in the top four. Um, you know, Al Gross obviously has his name in there and he's, he's known in democratic circles, although he's an undeclared, uh, right. Undeclared, or indep- whatever he calls himself. Um, but we'll caucus with the Democrats. Uh, and then you got the question of who, you know, where everybody else falls in there, you know, Chris constant now, Adam wool, who's got the, 
you know, they're probably both hating each other because they're both biting into their own base. You've got uh, Nick Beggage, who's got name recognition, although maybe not good name recognition because maybe many people don't know that Beggage is a conservative, uh, but they know the name. Uh, you've got John Coghill, who's got name recognition. So all these things go out. I mean, how much do you think that's going to play into the uh, – and then you've got the endorsements as well. So, I mean, how much do you think this is going to play into that? Oh, I think it's going to play a huge amount. I mean, I, I in, in, in trying to sort through the, the 48 or the 51 at the time I, I started this, I've got – there's 13 who have some form uh, of name recognition. Uh, they go all the way from – uh, Sarah Palin, who probably has the highest name recognition, uh, down to uh, Mary Sattler, uh, Paltola, uh, who's a uh, former state representative uh, uh, from, uh, from Bethel, who has some uh, name recognition, is a native, native Democrat, and has uh, some name, name recognition. So, I, but, but there's, a, there's about 13 that I, that, I, that I think have some form of name recognition. That's still a huge number. Yeah, but at least it's 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 the first step in organizing how you think about right how you how, how you think about the candidate. Well, don't forget about name recognition because Santa Claus is in this race, and he may have higher <laughs> name recognition than Sarah Palin. That's that old Santa. <laughs> of course, they don't. Well, I've got Santa. I've got Santa Claus in the thirteen. Yeah, no, I'm just going to say, even though that doesn't say that Santa Claus is a democratic socialist, although. I don't think my Santa Claus is, but maybe yours is. We'll, we'll see what happens here. David kind of lays out uh, some of my um, some of my thoughts on this. I mean, uh, now, first and foremost, let me say before everybody breaks out the torches uh, and everything that I like Sarah Palin as a person. Uh, I endorsed her as governor. I supported her. I've had her on the show several times. But, uh, I mean, let's face it, ever since that whole thing ended – She's been a bit of a train wreck, right? I mean, she's she still irritates the liberals, which I think a lot of people are looking for. Um, but she's got a lot of baggage. She's got a lot of things going on. Uh, he says, Palin has a lot of baggage and celebrity circus over the years. Her political capital is damaged, even with Trump's endorsement. He said, do not count baggage out just yet. He's the one who's been getting the grassroots and club endorsements. And I think there is some power to that. But really, I think this is going to come down to name recognition um, in a lot of ways. So... This will be this will be an, an interesting discussion, uh, but once she threw her hat in the ring, she was pretty much guaranteed a spot in the top four. I think simply because she's got the national recognition, uh, uh, you know, and and of course the name recognition here in the state of Alaska. Yeah, that's that. Ivan Moore was the one who said uh, she could lay on the couch, right? And still, uh, still end up in the in the top four, and that's probably true. I mean, it's you're going to have what you're really looking for in the first round is is a core group to get behind you. Ivan or somebody said that it's probably going to take 10 percent, uh, a 10 percent vote to get uh, to get in the uh, uh, in the top four, at least a 10 percent vote to get in the top four. And you really need that core 10 percent uh, uh, to stay with you. P Palin, you know, can Palin get 10 percent of the vote uh, uh, in Alaska? you would think that that's probably right. Right. Um, so, you know, that, that sort of puts her as, as Ivan said, she lay on the couch and, and be in the, in, in the final four. The question is, you know, when you get to neck baggage, can baggage get, can, can baggage get 10% after Palin takes her 10%? Right. Is there, is how it, much is, is it cutting enough, into uh, his? Yeah. Enough leftover to, uh, to, to, to vote for, to vote for Nick. So right. it, it, it's really, it's really, and, and, and you know, frankly, uh, Jeff Landfield had a had a panel on uh, on the landmine uh, 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 channel uh, a few days ago, and everybody and, and and Art Hackney was on there, and he was talking about Josh Revac because he's you know with Josh Revac's campaign. Right. Uh, he had somebody from the Ship Creek Group who's supporting uh, Mary Sattler, um, and then he had uh, 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 somebody else who was sort of uh, supporting uh, uh, Al Gross in a way. Um, the, the, the person I think they're overlooking is Tara Sweeney. So when you, when you, when you think about how do you get to 10%, uh, the native, uh, 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 corporations and the native community is going to play a big role in that. They can get you to 10%. The question is, are they going to, are they going to fraction between Mary and, and, and Tara and, and Milnati and, and others, but, but it, it's really, where is your 10%? That's, right. that's sort of the game. And get your ten percent coalesced, and get them all get them all voting for you. 
that's sort of the name of the game to get uh, to get to the second round. We were just uh, talking uh, with Brad before we went to break about number two of the weekly top three, which is, of course, the 48-person race for the U.S. House of Representatives. Brad had said he'd gotten things kind of pared down, and he put together a spreadsheet to look at some of the uh, candidates that he thought were you know, basically trying to thin the herd out to try and decide how to look at each one of these. And you've got it broken down to, what, 13 people total, Brad? Well, there's 13 people that have name recognition that have that have, I think, some ability to put together uh, uh, a core group that can get them uh, get them into uh, in, into the final four. Um, and but but that's sort of that's sort of the first tier. I mean, that's that's sort of the first sort that I've that I've that I've used to, to look at the uh, to look at the 48 that are out there who has name recognition, who has the potential to get into the final four. And as I said, I, I, I think there's 13 that have name recognition. They go from all the way from Sarah Palin and Santa Claus. You probably have the highest name recognition down to Mary Sattler Peltola, who um, uh, is a former state representative from Bethel, uh, head of the Bush caucus, has a, has a pro- profile in the native community. And again, if you're thinking about all you really need to do is put together a core group of 10% to get to the final four, uh, I think has the potential. So there's about... There's about 13 in that group. But then the next sort, I mean, some people immediately go to, well, are they conservative? Are they liberal? The next sort to me is, is whether they have the ability to bring home the bacon for Alaska. One of Don Young's best talents was his ability to, to bring home the bacon. And there's, there's, several, there's several categories, I think, or several criteria that go into whether or not you have the ability to bring home the bacon one of which is your ability to bid to build seniority. And frankly, that's a that's a that's an important sort to me. If if we send a guy or a, a woman there who is in the in the late middle final stages of their career, they're not going to have the opportunity to build seniority. And I and particularly for a state like Alaska that has only one percent, one representative, I think that's a huge uh, factor. So that to me knocks out people like Santa Claus, who's seventy-five, um, and who said uh, and who said that he's only going to serve out uh, the remainder of the current term, not uh, not stay there and, and run for uh, uh, for the regular term uh, uh, in the fall. Um, that knocks out John Coghill, who's seventy-one. It knocks out Andrew Halcrow to me, uh, who has said all he wants to do is run to serve out. Don Young's the current term. He's not running for long-term election. Well, it's important, I think, to uh, to view who we who we elect in the special election as someone who's who's going to be elected in the in the fall election. Right, because sometimes because sometimes that three or four months of seniority that would come from somebody running in the special election going into the regular election, sometimes that three or four months of seniority could mean the difference between a chairmanship and not. Oh, it, every time it will mean the difference between a chairmanship and not so any more seniority doesn't come just in clusters of two or in the Senate and six. It comes in the clusters of, of days. If you get sworn in, I mean, sometimes you will see a representative resign ahead of the end of his term so that his successor can be sworn in a few days in front of in front of the rest of the class. And if we're going to have a big change out, as, as some predict this coming this coming fall in terms of Republicans being elected. Uh, uh, taking Democrat seats, the Republicans taking back the Congress, um, getting a, a, a month or two of seniority, additional seniority in front of what may, many anticipate to be a huge Republican freshman class coming in, getting a month or two of seniority in front of them could make a huge difference. So, you know, I, I, to me, that's an important criteria in terms of being able to, to bring home the bacon uh, to Alaska. And I think it knocks out Halcrow. And I think it knocks out uh, 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 Emil Nadi, uh, who might otherwise be knocked out for other reasons, age. But it knocks out people who are saying that they aren't going to stick. Uh, they aren't viewing this as a long-term, uh, a long-term uh, position. So that takes. I know Halcrow's Hal- 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 got this rationalization for why he thinks. Uh, Hal- Halcrow's got rationalizations for a lot of things. <laughs> I, know he's, I, know, I know he's got a rationalization for why he thinks this is right. But I, in, from the perspective of what's best for Alaska, I think. I think running just for the just for the remainder of the term is the wrong step to take. Uh, so that brings your list from thirteen down to what at that point? When you start eliminating those numbers, where do you end up at? 
Well, that eliminates five between age and, uh, and, and only serving one term. That brings it down to eight. And then you've got three. I've got them marked in yellow on my, on my, uh, on my chart. Al Gross is 60. Um, so he's sort of at the tail end of, uh, of, of his middle career. I'm not sure how much opportunity he would have to build seniority. Uh, Sarah Palin is 58. Uh, and frankly, I think that's an uh, that's an issue with uh, with her. And uh, Adam Wool is sixty, which surprised me. I didn't realize Adam was that old, but Adam's sixty. So I think I think that's an issue with uh, with him as well. I think we ought to be looking at somebody who, who's going to serve 15, 20 years, maybe not forty nine as Don did, right? But 15, 20 years, build up to a chairmanship. I mean, Don's great heydays was when he was chairman of the Transportation Committee. He was able to really you know, uh, allocate funds, uh, uh, back home. So I think it's, I think, I think we ought to be looking at somebody who's going to have a 15, 20, uh, perhaps longer career. And when you look at people in their late fifties or sixties, uh, that's not giving them a whole lot of time to be able to do that. So that leaves, uh, on the field so far that I can count that leaves Chris constant as a Democrat. It leaves, uh, Josh Revac as a Republican, um, and Nick Begich as a Republican. Those are probably, I mean, imagine those have enough name recognition to make your top 13. Who else? Tara Sweeney. Tara Sweeney, uh, right. And, and Mary Sattler. Uh, the, and, and again, I, th- I, I think it is, I think we are, those, of, those who are looking at the race who are not counting in the native, the ability of the native vote to coalesce around, around a candidate are, are missing out. Um, so I think Tara has a, has, has a real chance. Then the next criteria I use beyond beyond that are the able to bring home the bacon is frankly for those who have had to vote on the issue how they voted on the PFD. I mean that to me indicates a concern about all Alaska families and right. indicates a concern about uh, about the overall Alaska economy. Uh, and a no vote I think on the PFD is an indicator that they tend to be more concerned about the top twenty percent or they tend to be more concerned about a particular special interest than they are about all Alaska families. And that takes out Revac. So frankly, by the time, uh, and Adam Wool uh, uh, as well. So frankly, by the time that, that I go through those two sorts, even before I get to looking at who's conservative and who's, and who's uh, uh, progressive on, uh, on the issues, I'm down to like five, four or five. And that's a much more manageable number I think, to start thinking about than uh, than certainly the 48 or the 13. I'm a little disappointed. I really enjoyed my conversation with Chris Bayh, who's the Libertarian candidate. I think he would make a great uh, congressman. Uh, But unfortunately, I don't think he has the name recognition. Doesn't mean that I wouldn't stop me voting for him, but I'm just saying that he doesn't have the name recognition that many of these other um, candidates do. and, um, and, And that's a problem. How do you square this, two minutes now, how do you square this with a discussion that I think we've had before about term limits and other things? I mean, I know we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to find what's best for Alaska, but um, any, does that factor into anything that you're, you're looking at here? I mean, obviously we don't want somebody there for 40 years, but even 20 years, I question sometimes. Well, Michael, if we're talking about what's best for Alaska, if we're talking about somebody who can position themselves to play a, a, the same sort of role that frankly Murkowski has on the appropriations side in the Senate uh, or Young has uh, in the House. We're talking about somebody who needs there to be there for, for a, a, long period of, a long period of time to build up the seniority. I think term limits works against Alaska. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't favor, I mean, in some other states, I might favor term limits, but I wouldn't favor uh, term limits here uh, for our congressional seat because it, we only have one seat and because the way that seat has gained significance is uh, is through seniority. Looks like we're not going to be able to get to the uh, Ukrainian issue uh, on the air, so we'll cover that over the top of the hour. Donna in the chat room says a Democrat isn't going to get a committee chairmanship. That's also probably should be on the list as, as well there. I mean, unless well, I... Well, a, Demo- a, 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 De- a Democrat isn't going to get a committee chairmanship this Congress, but a Republican isn't going to get a committee chairmanship this, this, this Congress. We need somebody like Young... Who was able to work both sides of the aisle, right? Um, and and that's another criteria I think that's uh, that's important in terms of being able to bring home the bacon. Well, uh, and that raises again questions about <clears throat> you know bombacity and uh, bipartisanship and everything else, which I guess is all for another day. You narrowed it down to four 
And that's before you even get to the progressive conservative. So with a conservative, there's really only two um, there's really only two choices at that point, and that would be uh, uh, Begich and Tara, uh, Tara Sweeney. Uh, and on the other side would be uh, uh, Sarah uh, Sattler and uh, uh, Constant at that point. So I guess it no- nails down to that. The question is, of course, what does the popularity contest say in the, uh, in, in the end? Let's deal with Ukraine, the issues, and what does it mean for Alaska oil and gas? We've got about four minutes here. So there's been a lot of uh, uh, more conversation recently about uh, the Alaska LNG project and and whether its position its 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 position is improving uh, as uh, as the Russian Ukrainian uh, situation has developed, particularly uh, given the uh, uh, the rejection of of uh, potential rejection of Russian oil and gas uh, uh, by others. Um, and and the and the need in Europe, the need in Europe for for LNG, the 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 conversation among the 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 LNG community, the people who really watch this, is that Gulf Coast projects, U.S. Gulf Coast projects, are likely to be absorbed into Europe uh, as uh, if, if the if the 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 prohibition on Russian gas uh, sticks uh, in Europe as it's likely to do, and and. U.S. LNG project, or Gulf Coast, U.S. Gulf Coast LNG projects that were initially looking to Asia uh, as as their market and working on contractual relationships with Asia, seem in recent days to be shifting to looking to contractual relationships uh, in Europe and uh, and and moving the volume to Europe. Shorter transit ta- transit time; they don't have to go through the Panama Canal. The net backs better uh, for the projects if they uh, if they go to Europe. Um, and and Europe's going to have a substantial demand, so that that really frees up an opportunity, creates an opportunity over on the Asian side, for for where is the additional volume going to come from, um, and Alaska LNG potentially plays a role in that. The real open issue is the, the real market on the Asian side is China, and the real open issue is whether the Russians are going to. The Russian gas is just going to divert over to China. If it's kicked out of Europe uh, and kicked out of other locations, is China just going to absorb the Russian gas? And if they do, then the world stays in the balance that it's been in, uh, which has made the Alaska LNG project a challenge project. If China does absorb the Russian gas, then the world stays in balance and Alaska LNG sort of stays in the same place that it was sort of on the outside looking in. If China doesn't absorb that Russian gas, if the Russian gas really, you know, gets kicked off the market or for lack of investment doesn't develop in the way, doesn't develop additional volumes in the way that people have anticipated, then I think there is the, the, the chatter in the, in the LNG community is there is an opportunity for Alaska LNG. The one drawback of Alaska LNG is it doesn't have a sponsor right now. It doesn't have somebody pushing the program. Nobody believes the state's going to step up ultimately and, and be the investor and, and, and build the facilities. And with a lack of a private sector in Boston, a private sector uh, uh, sponsor, Alaska LNG sort of gets left out of the conversation because no one's pushing it forward. So if there, there may be an increased opportunity, a realistic increased opportunity, depending upon what happens with the Russian LNG or the Russian gas volumes, but Alaska needs to needs to lock in the Alaska project needs to get a private sponsor, private sector sponsor to begin pushing it forward realistically. And what are the chances of that happening here about 90 seconds? I think there is a, I I think there is a chance if people view the world in the same way that it depends upon what happens to the Russia China relationship. And if they think that China ultimately won't take that gas for one reason or another, I think a private sector sponsor will step up. Uh, to to lead the to lead the Alaska uh, project because they'll see it as a potential money maker. So it's sort of it, it, the the worldview of whether or not of where that Russian gas is going to go, whether it's going to go to China, whether it's going to China is going to continue to invest in it in a way that will that will bring that gas forward. I think that's the key in in thinking about whether the Alaska LNG project is going to go forward. If it do, if if the sense is it does, then I think we'll have a private sponsor. The sense is it doesn't. I don't think we'll get a private sponsor. 
Well, we'll keep our ears peeled and eyes to the ground and see what's going on. Um, There are other markets in Asia, but China is the largest. uh, So we'll see what the ultimate uh, decision is on that. Uh, Brad, thanks for bringing it to our attention, and we appreciate you uh, coming on board and joining us this morning. As always, stay warm and uh, and enjoy yourself. Michael, as always, thanks for having me, and I'll I will try to stay warm. That's thanks. right, exactly. Well, the hoodie will help. I'm just saying the hoodie. That's will, right. The hoodie will help. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. Brad Keithley, Thank Alaskans you. for Sustainable Budgets. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.